Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. To do what I feel like I want to do. God, I, I just don't know what's going on. And I began to humble my heart before the Lord and hot salty tears of conviction and desire flooded my face. All of a sudden, while everybody was shouting and I had my head down convulsing in prayer, I heard a voice behind me say, I have called you and I will provide for you. I turned to see who it was because it was so evident and it was so real. I just knew somebody behind me had spoken to me. And when I turned around, the boys back there, some of them were in the floor and some of them were hanging over the pews. They didn't know I was in the world. And I just melted to the floor and said, God, whatever it is that you can do in my life, I'm yours. And I want to be used of the Holy Ghost. I can't say enough about Bible college. I say to you today, you're not wasting your time. The axiom that we were drilled, that I have found truth, is time spent sharpening the sickle is never wasted in the harvest. And I promise you, Raleigh, North Carolina is reaping the benefits of Texas Bible College. And you're doing a wise thing here today by getting yourself ready for whatever the will of the Lord is in your life. Texas Bible College has a lot of memories to me. Brother Green and I, of course, were fellow students, and uh, we enjoyed fellowship then. Uh, it was here that I learned to pray in that prayer room that used to be over there. I guess it's still over there. It was there that I learned to pray and talk to God. And uh, a lot of memories are here. I appreciate Brother Enzi. A uh, man that I've known for a long time. I won't tell you how long. I would never get invited back if I began to tell how long I've known him. But could I tell one experience? <laughs> it's on me. It's not on you. <laughs> Brother Enzi was in Greensboro, North Carolina when I was just a boy. And uh, our church went up to a watch night service at his place. You may not even remember that. It was an all-night service in Brother Enzi's church, uh, watch night service, foot washing, communion, and all that. And a busload came from Charlotte up there. And I was just a boy riding on that bus. And the reason I remember it so well, it was very bitterly cold, very cold. And I had to sit on the heater of the bus and... Worming around like boys do, I knocked the heater off, and everybody froze all the way up there and back. And they were grumbling and complaining and couldn't figure out why they were so cold. They said, well, I guess the heater has gone out. And what had happened had I'd knocked the switch out, and there was no heat on in that bus. And I've always admired Brother Enzi and appreciated the ministry that God has granted to him and the leadership abilities yes. that is in this great man of God. I'm very happy to see him at Texas Bible College, and I know the college will be all the better for it. And already can feel the impact of his life and his ministry upon this college. And Sister Enzi, a very sweet lady who loves God and quite a, an example for any Pentecostal young lady. And we're happy to be here today, and I'm going to condense my words. When I start preaching in a minute, I will preach like a machine gun. Because I'm going to cover a good bit of ground in a hurry. I'm excited about being here. I think it's only fitting today... That one of the greatest things I got while I was at Bible college is playing the organ right now. And that is my wife. I went three years and graduated. She went one semester and got her degree. It didn't take her long. Prophecy was fulfilled when God said he would do a quick work, cut it short in righteousness. It didn't take her long to get her degree. It took me a little longer to get mine. Amen. We met here in a chapel service. Back then, whenever you were to preach in chapel, 
I don't know if they still preach here or not. They let the boys preach back then. It was really, it was dangerous back then. I don't know if things have changed. I'll never forget a boy up here preaching, and he was, oh, he was expounding the Word of God in his evangelistic uh, uh, manner. And he was telling about his summer crusades and how God had blessed him mightily in the field of the harvest, you know. And he was moving the congregation, you know. And he said, I want to tell you something. He said, bless God, I was out here in West Texas preaching the word this summer. He said, we passed by a big field. And he said, church, I'm telling you, I saw one of the biggest concubines you ever laid your eyes on. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. <laughs> And what he meant was combines. Oh, we had some preaching back then. I tell you, we had some preaching. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. They gave me a slip of paper. He said, I, when I was to preach, they gave me this song. People who were going to sing and what they were going to sing. And I called on a young lady to sing that day. Sister Patsy Landtroop will sing for us now. I'll regret. And by the time she finished singing... I said, yes, she will. And she's going to sing it for you today. Well, I've been blessed with just a little of this world's goods. And I've given to my Jesus when I felt that I should But I'll lay it all down When they put me in the ground Then I'll regret I didn't give Just a little bit more to my But when it's time for me to go, there's one thing I'm sure I'll know. I regret I didn't give just a little bit more to my Lord. I've been blessed with perfect health and peace. I've been touched by the hand of my Jesus so many, so many times. He gave me a body that was strong. He gave me a heart and he filled it with a song. But I regret I didn't give just a little bit more to my Lord. child and he's been walking with me now over these many these many miles and when it's time for me to go there's one thing I'm sure I'll know I regret I didn't give just a little bit more one line there that says I gave him my heart when I was just a child and I'm sure that there's a lot of you maybe that were raised in a Pentecostal home and you received the Holy Ghost when you were just a child and sometimes it's easy for us to forget and to sort of just sort of uh, move along let life come as it will we forget that we owe a lot to the Lord 
and that we need to be daily searching for ways that we can repay the Lord. There's no way that we can repay Him. But daily we need to be searching for ways that we can work for the Lord because you know there is going to come a day that we're going to look back over all our works and say, well, right here I could have done this and right here I could have done that. And we're going to have tears in our eyes because we did not fulfill the things that we could have done in our life. I gave him my heart when I was just a child. And he's been walking with me now over these many, many miles. But when it's time for me to go, there's one thing. Sure, I know I regret I didn't give just a little bit more to my Lord. I regret I didn't give a little bit more to my Lord. Can we stand and worship the Lord together right now? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. I'd invite you to Judges chapter 5. For the sake of time, we'll read just verse 43, or 23, pardon me, Judges 5, 23. And I'd like to say again, it's my privilege to be here. It's quite an honor to come and be in this chapel service with you today. I highly esteem you in the work of the Lord, prize you as God's chosen possession. Realize that the hand of the Lord is here today upon lives. And I'm not just preaching to young people. And I'm preaching to future men of God, pastors of churches, evangelists and missionaries and CFC home missionaries, and men that will turn cities upside down with the Acts 2.38 message. You look at your buddy today and you say, him, you better watch out or you don't know who you're dealing with. That's one of God's prized men. You may be talking to a Moses that God's going to someday take into a city and lead out a people that will be a multitude to be ready for the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm happy to be here with Brother Keating, friend of ours from way back in Brother Johnson, and also uh, Sister Mahoney. Her son is a good friend of mine, and I appreciate the privilege of being here with all of our friends. Judges chapter 5 and verse 23. Curse ye me, Rose, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. I want to preach today, before I read one more scripture, I'll give you my subject, the curse of Meros. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. This scripture shakes the very foundation of my life. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 30. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth, gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Holy Ghost, speak to us now. Yes. Breathe on us with the unction and the anointing of your mighty power. Stir us, Lord, and help us not to be the same, but to receive something today from your presence and from your holy word that would change our lives. Thrust us into a new dimension of spirituality and Christianity. Break us out of the norm and the ritual and the routine of being a child of God. Help us to know that you can use us and that you can anoint us and you can bless us. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. 
The fifth chapter of the book of Judges gives to us a rundown of the history of the battles of God. The Bible said that God is a man of war. Christianity is symbolized with military and war. The Bible relates to us in this fifth chapter the events of God Almighty declaring war. The involvement of those who participate in the mighty battles of God against his enemies and foes. Against his adversaries and those who would stand between him and his divine purpose and plan. And I would say to you this morning that we are in the midst of mighty conflict in this hour. There is a spiritual battle that is being waged in 1982. That is of such great fierce nature that it behooves us. To find our place in the militant ranks of God's mighty army. Amen. My sword wants blood. I'm ready to go to war in the kingdom of God. Amen. I want a little devil blood on my sword if there is such a thing. I want a little bit of false doctrine scattered behind me laid low beneath the quick sword of the truth of the righteousness of the word of God. You caught my attention when you said you were going to have a debate here. I'm interested in that. I love this holy book. And I want to tell you today you're standing on a firm foundation of the beautiful principles of God's divine truth. What you're being taught here will shake the very hinges off hell, cause angels to come down to where you are, demons to tremble, diseases to depart, and the entire city to be shaken. Paul said the gospel of Jesus Christ is dynamite. We're handling dynamite in this place today. Amen. We're handling dynamite. Praise God. Now I want you to notice when God waged his warfare, when God got involved in a military aggression, when God got ready to pursue an enemy, notice with me as I give you a scriptural rundown of what took place when God went to war, when God declared battle, when God waged warfare, notice with me, the Bible said in Judges 5 and 2, willingly they offered themselves. Yeah. Willingly they offered themselves. When God went to warfare, there were those that willingly offered themselves. In verse number 4, the Bible said the earth trembled. When God went to war, the earth had a quake. When God declared war, the earth began to quiver. When God declared war, the earth perhaps said, I can't sling a sword. I can't wield a, an instrument of warfare. I'm not able to launch any type of military aggression. But I'll tell you what I'll do. When God declares war, I'll just tremble. Yeah. And maybe somehow that will cause God's enemies some inconvenience and assist God in his war. The heavens said, we'll just drop down. When God goes to war, the heavens said, we'll drop. There's nothing we can do to help God in this battle as far as physically. But the heavens said, we'll just drop. And when the heavens drop, you've got intensity of fog. And maybe the heavens were thinking, when I come down, I'll just cover up God's enemies. And that'll cause some confusion because the heavens wanted to get involved in God's warfare. The clouds said, we'll drop water down. We'll just bring water down. When God goes to war, we'll drop water. In verse 5, the mountain said, we'll melt. We'll just, we'll just vanish so that God's enemies won't have any place to hide. We'll make it easy for God to spot them. We'll make it easy for God to find them. The mountain said, we'll just melt right out of sight. Verse 7, Deborah, a woman, arose in Israel, a mother, a mighty militant lady of God. A woman got involved in the work of the Lord when God went to battle. Verse number 9, the Bible said, the governors of Israel offered themselves willingly. Men of might and esteem suddenly lost their reputation and said, just give me a sword. God's going to battle. I don't need to ride on a white horse and be in a high lofty position just let me get into battle somewhere and do the work of the Lord yes. verse number 11 the Bible said they that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing of water there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord sanctuaries and churches and congregations will become an entire different thing in the last days it'll be a place where we come together to escape the noise of the archers it's a place where we'll come to draw a little drink from the well of living water and there we will rehearse the mighty acts of god 
It's there that we'll talk about what God's doing in the home Bible study. It's there that we'll talk about what God's doing in the school. It's there that we'll talk about what God's doing in the job. That's the place where they will rehearse the mighty acts of God. Verse number 12, Deborah said, listen, I can't, uh, I'm not a mighty militant somebody. I'm not strong. I'm, I'm very weak in my body, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sing a song. I'll just utter a song. I'll sing a song and lead the captivity captive. I'll sing a song that will help God in his battle. Verse 14, Ephraim, the Bible said, a root came out of them against Amalek. Benjamin among the people. Makar came down governors out of Zebulun. Now notice this. Out of Zebulun there came those who handled the pen of the riders. I wouldn't normally preach this fast, but I'm in a hurry. Those that handled the pen of the riders. These people out of Zebulun said, we, we can't even, we can't fight. We're not fighters. We, we don't like blood. We don't like, matter of fact, we're sort of studious. But I'll tell you what we'll do. Y'all go ahead and fight and we'll keep score. People of Zebulun said, we can't, we can't wield a sword. We don't know how to fight. We don't like the sight of blood. But the Bible said they can handle a pen. And they said, we'll just write. And we'll tell about what God's doing in this battle. We'll tell what's happening. We'll record it. The Bible said in verse 15, he was sent on the foot into the valley. Some went on foot. They just began to walk. They got in the valley, in the battle. Verse 18, Zebulun and Naphtali were people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. Verse 19, the kings came and fought. Verse 20, the stars in their courses fought against Sisera against the enemy of God. The stars said, we'll get involved. We'll do what we can. The river of Kishon swept them away. The old river said, hey, there's not a whole lot I can do, fellas, to help you. God, there's not a whole lot I can do to help you in this battle. But the river said, if you'll knock them in, I'll carry them off. <laughs> Amen. I'm talking about when God goes to war. The river said, if you'll knock them in, we'll sweep them away. Verse 22, the horse hoofs were broken by the means of the prancing. The horses said, we can't shoot them, we can't stab them, we can't spear them. But if you'll knock them off, we'll stomp them. We want to be involved in the work of God. We want to be a part of the battle of God. We want to be in the midst of what God's doing. We want to do something to let God know that we're for Him. Hallelujah. Amen. And then all of a sudden, the brakes of heaven are thrown on with a screeching halt. And bitterness comes belching out of an angel of God. And he screams out, curse you, me, Rose. Curse you, me, Rose. Curse you bitterly. And the angel of God became very upset with this man who was a tribe called Meros. It was not because of an act of immorality. It was not that he had reproached the name of Almighty God. But the reason the angel cursed him is because that while stars were fighting, while rivers were fighting, while the earth was trembling, while riders were riding, where people with spears were taking lives, Meros did not do anything. He refused to come to the help of the Lord. He refused to get involved in God's battle. And God said, I curse you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. It's time that Pentecostal young people got dissatisfied with being pacified just by knowing the truth. It's time to do something with what God's given you. It's time to use what you know. Oh, hallelujah. The devil tiptoes past TBC Sanctuary. He, the devil tiptoes past the UPCs on every street corner because he's afraid that something might happen to awaken this church to the sleeping powers of God that reside within it. Oh, there's a revival in this school that could shake North America. There's a revival in this school that could shake the entire work of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody made their contributions. Everybody was doing what they could. Everybody was doing the least little bit something to get involved in the work of God yes. until they came to Miro's and God cursed him because he refused to come to the help of the Lord to help of the Lord against the mighty. Amen. There was a little woman who came broke an alabaster box of ointment. 
poured that precious material upon the head of the Lord. The disciples became very disgruntled and complained. But while they were complaining, Jesus was complimenting. And Jesus said to them, leave her alone, for she has done what she could. Jesus said, you leave her alone. It may not be what you can do, Peter. She may not preach the message of Acts 2.38, the first New Testament crusade message. She may not be like you, James and John and the rest of you fellas, but you leave her alone because she has done what she could. And Jesus complimented her. And you talk about a compliment, you know what he said? Wherever this gospel is preached, in TBC, on a chapel service, on Thursday morning, Jesus said, they're going to talk about you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to remember you because you just did what you could. And that's all I've ever wanted anybody to do. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. I haven't done anything fantastic. I just want to do what I can. I just want to do what I can. There's nothing supernatural about us. But I want to do what I can for the work of God. Woo! The only time we're going to get a compliment from Jesus is when we do what we can do. That's right. Yes. Yes. Praise. Hallelujah. Praise. Hear that. Amen. Amen. The old story is told and probably familiar to you of how the bear came roaring out of the bushes and the old couple was living at the edge of the woods. And Ma screamed, Ma, God, Paul, do something. Paul running the house, got the old double barrel shotgun, come running out with his bib overalls, chasing the bear into the woods. Booming away. Woo. And the bear was headed out. All of a sudden, he looked back to see what happened to Ma. And there she was right on his heels, waving an old brush. Had a brush in her hand. Waving it in the air. And just a screaming. When things finally settled down, he asked her. He said, Ma, what in the world did you think you could do against a bear with just a hairbrush? She said, Paul, you know, I thought about that. And she said, really, I didn't figure I could do much with a brush against the bear. But she said, the whole idea was I just wanted the bear to know Whose side I am on. Hey. Woo. Hallelujah. There's something moving in the UPC that says, I don't want to be identified with the world. I don't want to be identified with carnality. I don't want to be identified with worldliness. Dear God, I want you to know I'm on your side. I want you to know I'm on your side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This school needs to stand to their feet today and say, Jesus, don't you ever let a doubt be in your mind. We're on your side. We're on your side. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! You'll never do anything for God until you make up your mind whose team you're on. You'll never be anything for God until you make up your mind. I'm on God's side. I'm on God's team. I'm on God's side. Why don't you make up your mind? I'm going to be a one God, apostolic, holy, rolling, Jesus name, born again believer. I'm going to be a soul winner. I'm going to be a crusader. I'm going to be an evangelist. I'm going to be a revivalist. I'm going to be a spiritual arsonist. And everywhere I go, I'm going to leave a little fire behind me. God bless you. You may be seated. The, pr 
problem with the church is we're in the last hour. And the man said, why stand you here all the day idle? Idle. We've got a situation in the kingdom of God. we got folks that are standing on the promises and sitting on the premises. <laughs> Amen. And they're waiting to get hired. Uh, they're waiting to get hired. They said, no man has hired us. Amen. I'm waiting on me a position to open up. I'm waiting on somebody to ask for my resume. I'm waiting to somebody can offer me more than I've got now. Some folks let that determine the will of God. Well, if it's paying more than I got now, it's got to be God's will. That's the way they feel about it. But I'm going to tell you something. God don't want us to get hired. He wants us to get fired. When you get fired up in the Holy Ghost, something will get a hold of you. And then you will begin to say, I must not just attend. Involved. I must not be a spectator. I've got to be a participator. For Jesus said, if you are not gathering with me, you are scattering. If you're not gathering, you are scattering. But we place ourselves primarily in the shoes of old Naaman who was rebuked by servant when the prophet of God told him what his role was in order to have a miracle. He didn't like his part in the miraculous play. <laughs> What's my part? Tell me what to do. He said, well, you've got to go down to the river of Jordan, dip seven times in a mud hole, and then you'll be clean." And Naaman got mad and started to leave. And all the words of wisdom that rolled from the lips of a servant. He said, now let's be reasonable, master. He said, he didn't ask you to do anything great. He said, as a matter of fact, if he would have asked you to do something great, you would have done it. But he just asked you to take a bath in a mud hole. Now, is that asking too much? We find ourselves in this position. Everybody is ready to do something great for God. And nobody wants to get involved. With the small things. He said, if he would have asked you to do something great, you would have done it. But he's just asking you to do something that's easy. Maybe you've heard the old story about the two fellas that were talking. And one of them asked his buddy, he said, if you had a million dollars, would you give me 500, would you give me a million, would you give me 500,000 of it? He said, well, if I had a million dollars, you know I would. Sure I would. Me and your buddies. I'd give you 500000 if I had a million. He said, if you had two Cadillacs, would you give me one of them? He said, why, sure, man. You know, you and I are good buddies. I'd be glad to give you one of my Cadillacs if I had two. He said, well, if you had two hogs, would you give me one of them? He said, shut up your mouth, man. You know I got two hogs. We are always ready to do what we can't do 
But God's not interested in what you can't do. Let me preach to you young fellas here today. If you want to be great, if you want to be a camp meeting preacher, if you want to be an evangelist and preach in the large churches or you want to pastor a great church someday, you better find out what it's like to preach in the jail, on the street corner, in the hospitals, in the convalescent centers, wherever you get a chance to pray. Because if God can't trust you with those things, you'll never do anything else. I said you'll never do anything else. Hallelujah. But when God finds out you'll do what you can with all your heart, he'll say, you passed that test. I'm fixing to give you a little bigger one now. I'm going to lead you on up. David, 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 you kill the bear. That's all right. You kill the lion. That's all right. Now I'm fixing to give you a giant, boy, because you have graduated. Hallelujah. You think God's going to choose you in the limelight. Let me tell you where God found David. When did God choose David? I'm getting excited. When did God choose David? When he killed Goliath, God said, hey, you're a good one. I'll take you. No. When David was anointed king? Oh, no. That's not when God chose him. I'll tell you when God chose him. The Bible said God chose David from following the ewe lambs. (laughs) And a ewe lamb in everyday terminology, is a sheep that's in the family way. (laughs) That's what my mother used to always term it. (laughs) A ewe lamb is a sheep that's in the family way. One that's got a young. One that's carrying a baby. God said, David, I watched you when that old ewe went astray and you chased after her. And with tender love, you headed her back to the flock. God said, I was watching that, David. Nobody else was out there. You were all alone. And you didn't know anybody was watching. But God said, David, that's when I made up my mind. That's the boy that I want to be king of Israel. It's when everybody else is playing basketball that you ease into the prayer room without a show and you slide up under the altar and nobody's there. And you said, oh God, I want to do something for you. I want to do what I can. God, I want to do what I can. It's then that God punches Gabriel and says, you better watch that boy. Keep your eye on him, Gabriel, because I'm going to show you what I can do with that young life. When you get to the place where you're willing to do what you can for God, then God can use you. Everybody's saying there'll be a more opportune time when I get more, when I have more, when I am more. Oh, no. You've got to do what the man is taught in the principle of the talents. One was given five, one was given two, and one was given one. The one with one was rejected. You know why? Not because he didn't have two. Not because he didn't have five. But because he didn't get involved with the one. Woo! I've got to get involved with what I've got. I can't preach like Brother Enzi. I can't preach like Brother Green. But I've got to do what I can do with what God's given me. And there is a place, there is a place that what God's given me and what I have is exactly what's needed. Woo! 
high Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. I said there's a place that God needs exactly what you are. There is a place where God needs exactly what you are. Let's love the Lord right now. God said, curse you, me, Rose. Because you didn't do what you could do to help my cause. I wasn't asking you to do something that was beyond your reach. I just wanted you to do what you could. And because you wouldn't, I'm going to curse you. When that desire begins to burn in us that we want to do what we can. Hallelujah. I just want to do what I can. That's what God wants us to do. Everybody heard about the plane crash in Washington, D.C. What a tremendous tragedy it was. I was in Atlanta, Georgia, waiting on a flight to leave when somebody told me about the plane crash in Washington, D.C. That's a little unnerving. It wasn't long until, you know, out of every tragedy, there seems to emerge a hero. It wasn't long until the papers had found the hero. It was a man who was standing on the icy banks of the river and he saw a stewardess, airline attendant, going down for the last time. He plunged into those icy waters, drug that lady to the shore and saved her life. Newspapers made him a hero for risking his own life to save her. This is his response. He said, I didn't do anything that anybody else would not have done if there had been a man and been standing where I was standing and saw what I saw. He said, I just had to do what I could. He said, don't make me a hero. I'm not a hero. He said, I just did what I could. And I don't deserve any halos or any crowns. I just did what I had to do. If we could stand today on the shores of time and eternity... Watch the drowning souls of men and women as they slide into the lake of fire. If we could drive through the cities after cities that have no united Pentecostal church. The thing that drove me to Raleigh, North Carolina from a comfortable position as an evangelist was not that I felt that I could build a church. It was not that I felt that it was time for me necessarily to do something different. It was not that I felt that I was adequate, for I felt quite inadequate. But something inside of me said 300,000 souls. Somebody's got to get over there. And I said, God, I may not be able to do as good as somebody else, but I'm going to do what I can to help 300,000 souls hear the truth. And that's really all God's asking us today. It's just do what you can. Do what you can with my harvest. I know you can't get them all in. I know I can't win them all in my area. 
And I'm not telling you today because you give to Christmas for Christ that everybody's going to be saved. But this is what I've got to tell you. We need to give so they can have a choice. Right now, they don't have a choice. They're going to Trinitarian churches because there's not a one God church in their town. They were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Catholic, Catholicism all over them because there was not a man there to tell them, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. There are drunks in those cities today that are drunk because they don't have a choice. There's nobody there to preach to them Acts 2.38 that can change your life. There are young men on the streets that are high on drugs because there's nobody there to tell them. There is a better way. And God's not looking for superstars. He's looking for men of scars who can bear in their bodies the marks of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads right now? I'm praying right now that a great thrust of the Holy Ghost would step into this tabernacle. Somebody in this building would begin to feel, I don't have a choice. I have got to do what I can. I can't sit idly by anymore. I've got to do what I can for the kingdom of God. Lord, it may not be the greatest and it may not be the most renowned, but I want to do what I can in the kingdom of the Lord. God can use anybody that will make themselves available. I guess one of the most stirring services or things that I've been told of late is the story, now you listen to me, of a young teenage boy, Brother Green, who was mentally somewhat retarded. He had to have somebody staying with him around the clock because he was unable to take care of himself. One of our very finest evangelists came to their church to preach a revival. When the revival was over, this mentally deranged young man got a hold of one of the tapes of this evangelist preaching. He memorized that message. From beginning to end. And would quote it all the time. And as a matter of fact, he started telling everybody, I am. And he called the name of the evangelist. He said, I am brother so and so. You want to hear me preach? And he would preach his message from the beginning to the end. One night his mom and dad were going to be gone. And so they hired a babysitter to come take care of this, this young man. A lady came over. To sit with him. The message was on prophecy. And this mentally retarded boy told that lady, he said, sit down. I am evangelist so and so. He said, I'm going to preach to you. And he started in with what he had memorized from a cassette. In just a little while, the lady started crying. In just a little while, he told her to kneel and pray. The next Sunday, she came to church and God filled her with the Holy Ghost and she was baptized. God's just wanting somebody that will tell his word. Somebody that will do what they can. 
Just do what you can. Right now, we're going to pray before we receive these commitments. But I feel like the greatest commitment today is a commitment of yourself. And I don't mean to be little what we're going to do because we're coming after a good offering here for Christmas for Christ. We need it. We got men ready right now to go that need the money. But I'm preaching to young men today that need to answer the call of God in their lives. And someday go themselves. But the only way God will ever allow you go is if you send, first of all, some reflections of your inward feelings. And that's gifts of love so somebody else can go. Right now, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, would you pray right now, Lord, help me to do what I can to save this world. God, help me to do what I can. My part my part, my part, my part, my part. Help me to do my part to win the loss to you in Jesus' name. And right now, we're going to sing a chorus. And those of you that want to commit yourself to the Lord, Say, I'm going to do what I can. I want you to stand to your feet. Not in frivolity, not in lightness, not as an obedience to those that are in the pulpit, but you'll stand and say, God, I do want to do what I can. I want to do what I can. Is there anything I can do for you? Is there Is there anything?